there's a virus loose on planet Earth. It's infecting hundreds of millions of adults and children every day on every continent. Each one of us is a potential carrier. Welcome to Planet YouTube, an unrecognizable world in which your home movie is bigger than a Hollywood blockbuster. YouTube has been part of a new world order. It has shifted culture. And backyard science experiments can go global. Oh, this is awesome. A world where anyone can be a superstar. He was the first true social media worldwide phenomenon. Where presidents are elected. YouTube allowed us to elect an outsider as president of the United States. And dictators deposed with the click of a mouse. And it's anonymous, so it's so dangerous. And the power of the viral is unstoppable. I was like, wow, 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 wow. Over the next hour, we'll get to the bottom of the epidemic, tracking down the unlikely pioneers and accidental celebrities who in just 10 years have brought world culture to its knees. Charlie Bit My Finger is one of the biggest viral videos in history. More people watched Charlie Bit My Finger than tuned in to watch the moon landings. Not bad for a video that was never supposed to be posted on YouTube in the first place. Video and Charlie bites Harry's finger, which I found quite funny, but probably a few weeks later, I came back, looked at it, and thought, oh, that's probably worth sharing with the boy's godfather in America. Now, a world exclusive. We can reveal the untold story behind the sweetest domestic assault in history. On the day of the video, what, we, what I was doing again is I was just videoing the boys out in the garden. And there is a moment, Charlie gets in the car and, and Harry drives him into bushes and leaves him there. Which I thought at the time was really quite a funny little, little clip. But when Charlie then bites Harry, it sort of feels a little bit like just desserts because he's got him back. He posted it on YouTube, expecting feedback from one person. Instead, within 10 months, it had been viewed 11 and a half million times. Everyone wants to know, what is his secret? I think that is the beauty of our video, there is no secret. If there was a secret, I would have made a second, wouldn't I? But some academics who studied virals disagree. Some people think that virals just random, luck, chance, that it's like bottling lightning. But it's not. There's a science behind it. A science that was about to be exploited. Even before Charlie Bit My Finger had entered the culture, a video emerged of Brazilian soccer star Ronaldinho. What he did next is almost unbelievable. So the Ronaldinho video was one of YouTube's first big sensations, in part because it was capturing something that seemed so superhuman. This great soccer player kicking the ball off the crossbeam of the goals four times in a row. The buzz wasn't about Ronaldinho's ball skills, but whether or not the video was real. There is something a little bit suspicious about the golden box with the Nikes in them that he opens. And the way that it sort of pulls back so you can't really see the details so well at the most important moments. There was a lot of speculation over whether it was real or fake and debates that went on online. The clip is the first to reach a million hits before the creators are soon exposed as Nike. And that made light bulbs come on all over the place. But actually, there was potential in YouTube, an online video, as an advertising medium. Nike had subverted the home video viral and commercialized it. The next mutation would be even more surprising. Well, I video blog is about me. My name is Bree. I'm 16. Um, I don't really want to tell you where I live because you could like, stalk me. On June 16th, 2006, a video appears on YouTube with the tagline, Lonely Girl 15. Um. Within three months, the teenage star would be the subject of a media frenzy, bringing YouTube to mass attention. 
Lonely Girl 15 was this cute, really candid teenager. She was sort of fighting with her parents a lot, and she was arguing with her boyfriend. You know, if you wrote an email to her, she would respond to you and say, thanks for the idea, you know, here's another thought. So people formed this really personal connection to her. Within three months, over half a million viewers are tuning in for Lonely Girl 15's updates. The more eagle-eyed of them begin to notice that Bree's bedroom blog is just... It was just a little too neat. You know, the edits were a little bit too good, the music was synced up too well. One fan went through and noted all of the items in her bedroom were from Target. So there was some conjecture that maybe this was some sort of viral marketing. Fans demand answers from Bree. When she doesn't reply, an LA Times reporter smells a scoop. It was a great mystery. This girl hiding in plain sight, as it were. He sets off to learn the true identity of Lonely Girl. But no one was quite expecting what he would uncover. And that's when we knew we had her. In the summer of 2006, the viral video went mainstream as an online mystery turned into a real-world manhunt. The race was on to track down the vlogger behind the latest YouTube sensation, Lonely Girl 15. Okay, so I'm kind of in a blue mood again today. This was like huge national news. She wouldn't say where she lived, so there was this kind of treasure hunt kind of aspect to it. I've been calling my parents all day. Gradually, the videos began to take the form of a thriller with a plot almost as intriguing as Lonely Girl herself. It was a great mystery. No one knew who she was, and no one could find her. Let's find who this girl is. What are they doing? There was a botanist who analyzed the flora and the fauna in the video and said it could only appear in this one little portion of Northern California. But where? After 10 fruitless weeks, the reporter and his colleagues launched an audacious sting to out Lonely Girl 15 using an email tracker. In those days, when you sent a message through MySpace, you could implant a tracking code that allowed you to see where that message had been opened. We sent up a lot of fake accounts pretending to be fans of Lonely Girl and sent messages to her, her MySpace page. And it was open in the server belonging to the Creative Artists Agency. And that's when we knew we had her. The Creative Artist Agency represents actors, writers, and directors. When Richard confronts them with the evidence, the real Brie comes forward. 19-year-old actress Jessica Rose. Millions believed in her, but it was all an act. Now, for the first time, meet the girl behind Lonely Girl and the men who pull the strings. So the idea was we're going to build a huge audience. We're going to make them committed and passionate about this character and the storyline. She's going to run away from home, and then we're going to release a DVD that will be an independent feature film about the story of a group of fans on YouTube trying to find this girl who's vanished. The movie never happened, but Lonely Girl continued online for two years. I learned how to see the world from a completely different point of view when I was four. The YouTube viral video was evolving at faster and faster rates. But some videos were more infectious than others. Inspiring viewers not just to watch, but to make a version of their own. One of the first videos to have this effect was created by an unlikely pair of backyard chemists. My name is Fritz, and I had 20 years working as a professional juggler. My name is Steven, and I had 20 years as a trial lawyer. But a friend of ours told us about this Coke and Mentos experiment. He asked me, have you ever heard about this crazy thing? You drop Mentos into Diet Coke and something happens? And so Stephen came to visit me and said, we got to try this. So we went out in the backyard like a lot of people, dropped a handful of Mentos into a bottle of Coke. Oh, this is awesome. That's how it started. On June 3rd, 2006, Stephen and Fritz posted their own Coke and Mentos display online. An epic 101 bottle tribute to the Bellagio Fountain in Las Vegas. When we first put our video online, it was a Saturday morning in June. We told exactly one person. 
The next day, we had 14,000 views, and by mid-afternoon, and hundreds of thousands. All from telling one, one person. person. By the end of 2006, the Coke and Mentos spectacle had turned into a YouTube mega viral with 12.5 million views. And something about it made people want to make Coke Mentos videos of their own. Dark Coke and Mentos, what a fantastic meme. Hey, can you put the Mentos in your mouth? I've done it myself, I've made my own film of it, I've put it on YouTube in fact. Um, it's great, it works on so many levels. On the one hand it's sort of a science experiment. You see it and you go, really? Does that really work? Good God. Um, alright, I think, uh, I think this is, um, not going so well. Stephen and Fritz have their own theory for its viral success. Everyone's favorite moment in our video, they always say it's, that's that moment of humanity that you can really connect with. That's what helps make it extra contagious. The contagion boosted global sales of Diet Coke by over 5%. Mentos, 15%. Silicon Valley's giants took notice of YouTube's growing power. Meanwhile, the explosion of video content meant that YouTube servers were sent into virtual meltdown. And there were times where we were hours away from running out of hard drive space, storage space. I mean, just overall, we couldn't take any more videos. It was like four hours left. I didn't think that it was going to blow up that quickly. I mean, that was a good thing, but it was my credit card that was getting blown up as well. YouTube needed a bigger home, fast. YouTube, a website that didn't even exist two years ago, was purchased today by Google for $1.65 billion. <laughs> the acquisition of YouTube by Google was one of the best deals in the history of the world. Uh, the estimated value of, of uh, YouTube now is, is something like 70 or 80 billion. <laughs> the, king, the, king, the king of search, the king of video have gotten together. We're going to have it our way. YouTube now had the resources of a major player. The viral video was about to take off in a whole new way. I was looking for the right person who could do it. I was looking for that star who was truly a star. Scooter Braun was an ambitious music exec who recognized YouTube's potential early on. On YouTube, Scooter found a 13-year-old Canadian kid who'd posted a video of himself performing in a talent contest. He first tried to launch him with the record labels. Everyone said no. Everyone said no. Because they said, well, this kid's on YouTube. We can't monetize this. So the only way to make people understand was to not care about the gatekeepers anymore, not care about the suits, and care about the people. So Scooter turned back to YouTube and devised strategies for building Bieber, a cult following. One of the tricks um, that, I, that I use that I've actually never talked about in any interview um, is that I never let him introduce himself. The reason I did that is because when you watch a video when someone doesn't introduce themselves and the video is extraordinary, you feel like you're getting to see something you're not supposed to see, it's more exciting. And that was one of the tricks that I felt worked for us and made those views become bigger and bigger. Then the time came to test Bieber's online popularity in the real world. Neither Scooter nor the music industry predicted how it was about to change everything. And I announced with social media that he was going to do an acoustic performance and sign autographs in front of the Universal Music Building in London. He played his guitar and a whole crowd was singing all the words at one time. Everyone on the label was looking out of their windows just in complete shock because no one had ever pulled a crowd that big. He didn't even have a song out there. And that's when I knew that it was working. It's crazy. A lot of girls, as you can see. Because of YouTube. 
Justin Bieber was the thesis statement of taking a person from YouTube and using YouTube as a platform and building it into a worldwide star. He was the first true social media worldwide phenomenon. And YouTube was the platform I chose to make that happen. YouTube has completely changed the music industry on how we discover and how we promote things. If you go to a record label now and you say, hey, I have this new artist, they say, well, can you send me a YouTube you know, clip and how many views does it have? Gatekeepers are meaning less and less and less. And the people mean more and more and more. And that is democracy. Scooter had created YouTube's first ever global superstar. But no one could have seen the epidemic heading our way. My biggest regret of entire my life was making that horse dance move. This is what I found. Within years of its launch, YouTube made it possible to almost instantly transform budding pop stars into global celebrities. The next superstar could be anyone, and as it turns out, from anywhere. Psy was a South Korean pop star, barely known outside of his country, but with over 10 hit singles to his name. My previous songs and previous dance moves and previous video, all of them were like similar. Then in 2012, he wrote a song poking fun at his swanky neighborhood, Gangnam, and threw his energy into creating a new dance move. Gangnam is a name of district in Korea. You might think the district as some sort of Beverly Hills type, hot and wealthy area. I have my own choreographed teams in Korea, and we were focused on making a new move for the new song. We literally tried everything on the universe, not just horse, but every animal, every creatures on the universe. Sai finally settled on an equine dance and made a video intended only for Korean broadcasts. I was not friendly with internet things at all. So I didn't do Twitter and I didn't do Facebook. And I honestly didn't know that much about YouTube before Gangnam Stop. But one of his team persuaded him to post the new video onto YouTube. Two weeks later, he gets a call from a major player in the music business. My buddy sent me a video that had 100,000 views out of Korea. And I said, I can make this huge. He goes, you want him to do it in English? I said, no, I want him to keep it in Korean. And two weeks later, I'm talking with his translator, explaining that I want to keep it in Korean. Sai looks at me, looks at his translator, looks at me again and goes, if you come drinking with me in Koreatown tonight, I'll do this deal. And I looked at him and I said, you speak English? And he goes, I went to Berkeley. To Sai, to Korea, breaking down barriers to the future. Thanks a lot. Scooter and his team used their network to help spread Gangnam style fever in the West. <laughs> A lot of worldwide celebrities started to tweet my video. Britney Spears, Robbie Williams, Tom Cruise. People told me like, your song became like trending of the Twitter. And I was like, trending? What is trending? <laughs> There were a lot of people eager to learn the dance moves. It seemed no one was immune from the Gangnam infection, not even the Secretary General of the United Nations. He became the second famous Korean in the universe right now. And it triggered countless copycats. I think it was really a cultural phenomenon. What he was doing was crazy. It was surprising. And so they shared it with other people because they couldn't believe what was happening. Like once it, it exploded, you know, like huge, I was like surprised literally every day and every moment, like, wow, 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 wow. Nothing draws a crowd like a crowd. A few people share it, and then they see their friends share it, and they don't want to be left out. So next thing you know, they start sharing, and it becomes this snowball. We watched as this video spread from Korea to the United States to South America to Europe. As Gangnam Style continues to rack up one million views per day, 
Will Psy always be living in its shadow? My biggest regret of entire my life was making that horse dance move. You know, I cannot top it. I cannot top it, you know? We came up with a game plan, and that video now is the most watched video in the history of the internet. Gangnam Style has now been watched over 2.3 billion times. That's the equivalent of everyone in China, Europe, and America combined. Incredible. It's like being struck by lightning. Something that happened, and I don't think will ever happen again on that scale. He gave a little bit of happiness to everyone. The music has always done that. The difference is now a slightly overweight, sorry, Sai, uh, over a uh, man from Korea. I sent a song and an incredible piece of content with that video, put it online, and the entire world can enjoy it within seconds. That was never possible before. Gangnam Style showed that YouTube now reached a global population like nothing else. Soon, it wasn't only pop stars harnessing that power. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. And for better or worse, YouTube became the propaganda tool of our time. In 2008, one visionary recognized the internet's ability to reach a new audience. But did YouTube help elect an outsider as president of the United States? In 2007, Barack Obama was up against the well-financed Hillary Clinton in the Democratic presidential nomination. Hillary Clinton had most of the party establishment behind her, and so the only path for Obama was to build a big national grassroots movement from scratch. Joe Rosepars was a new breed of strategist, employed to head up Obama's social media campaign, starting with Obama's own website. Uh, I hope that you use this website as a tool to organize your friends, your neighbors, uh, and your networks. We can do a different kind of campaign. Here's the thing, it can only happen if you get involved. We wanted them to forward along our content from YouTube. We wanted them to make uh, phone calls from home. We wanted them to knock on doors. We wanted them to chip in five and $10 here and there. That was the, the, the nature of the grassroots activity. A video of one of his speeches posted on YouTube went viral. And so too did his campaign. The, the Yes We Can video actually went viral over the weekend. We didn't make the video. That was something that supporters made and then posted to YouTube, which ultimately allowed it to spread. We will begin the next great chapter in the American story with three words. If you hit the right emotional notes, this stuff can go everywhere. You are not dependent upon the media to define your message for you. But just as YouTube was inching Obama ever closer to the White House, his rivals hit back, questioning Obama's track record on the subject of race politics, threatening to split his support in half. Uh, this was kind of a cliffhanger moment for the election. You know, was this going to sink this candidate? How would he respond? And there was a lot of buildup to the speech. Against all predictions to the contrary, we saw how hungry the American people were for this message of unity. Despite the temptation to view my candidacy through a purely racial lens. Obama's race speech was hailed as a game changer. Uploaded onto YouTube, it snowballed, getting 1.6 million views in 48 hours. He really did knock it out of the park. Even his critics sort of admitted this. Fueled by this success, Obama's team posted over 2,000 YouTube clips during his march to the White House. It raised Obama's profile across the nation. Hey, B, it's me. At the same time, Obama fans were getting in on the act, posting their own campaign messages online. Obama Girl was a huge viral video of the time, scoring over 26 million hits. I went on YouTube once. I, I don't go real often. It's just to see 
what was being sort of generated under my name. Some of them were pretty creative. You know, there's some cartoon, and yeah. you know, your ears are all huge. <laughs> People are hungry for content that's outside of the traditional press. YouTube allowed us to run a grassroots campaign to elect an outsider as president of the United States. And it is my pleasure to welcome After Obama became president, he continued to use the platform to connect directly with the nation. Thanks. We've invited three top YouTube creators here to the White House today. We're in the East Room, and they have set up their own YouTube sets right here in the White House. Great to see you, Hank. President Obama. Hey, Glozell. Hello. How are you? Good, how are Good you? Good to see you. Great to Thanks. meet you. I don't really feel like I'm having you. This is your house. You know, well, it's the people's house. This is, uh, I'm actually... Obama's YouTube campaign proved once and for all that anyone could get their message to the world. The value of a channel like YouTube is it allows for the democratization of content. Before, only the media outlets could decide what news we saw. But now, each one of us can create news. In 2007, YouTube underwent a seismic change. The modern smartphone hit the mass market, and this technological evolution created a new way of capturing and sharing news called citizen journalism. One individual who shoots a video on their camera phone, thousands of people can view it in a few minutes and it can be shared to thousands more in the next hour. Anybody with the mobile phone and access to the internet can become a journalist with the advent of YouTube. Having YouTube clips of disasters as they're happening lends them this intimacy and this reality uh, that otherwise it would feel fairly abstract. It's very hard not to be touched and not to care. In the hands of citizen journalists, the power of the viral video can turn personal stories into global stories. YouTube allow people all over the world to actually create their own mechanisms of sharing their own stories. So you can take a story that might be very personal and all of a sudden using virality make it something that has a, a level of global sympathy. In June 2009, during protests in Tehran, 26-year-old Nada Aga Sultan was shot in the street. These images from Iran went viral on YouTube and shocked the world. It wasn't just the fact that she was brutally killed. It was the fact that a video in very, very visceral and graphic detail showing her killing actually was being captured at that very moment. And they used YouTube to make that story much more global. Viral videos began to drive social change. Change that was spreading across the Middle East in what became known as the Arab Spring. Abuse can't happen in, in secret anymore, whether it's autocratic governments in the Middle East, whether it's police abuse here in the United States. In the era of YouTube and smartphones, everybody is a potential journalist. You can't kick every potential journalist out of the country because you'd have to kick everybody out of the country. Every form of social change has always had a media component to it. The fundamental media propaganda tool of our time today is YouTube. So that doesn't mean that it's a truth-telling, storytelling mechanism. It means it's a tool like any other that can be used by different parties for different types of political and social aims. YouTube had helped elect presidents, topple regimes, and create worldwide phenomena. Now, things were about to come full circle as ordinary people would cash in big on YouTube fever. Today, YouTube has given birth to a new generation of media creators, and their fan base is huge. 
Variety just did a study among teenagers and asked them who are their top stars. And the top five stars were all YouTubers. YouTubers are ordinary people creating content for their own channels. They're trying to make YouTube more like a TV network um, and they're promoting their, their stars with ad campaigns, which is something that you only have seen media properties do before. When we think about the early days of YouTube, we think about the individual viral video, the person who captured that one moment and shared it with the world. I think one thing that's changed dramatically is that more and more people have been producing things regularly. These homemade YouTube channels are drawing billions of views, creating a new generation of bedroom millionaires. Two of the most successful content creators on YouTube started off on the live comedy circuit, then created... Epic rap battles pits two famous icons against each other in a rapping competition. I stopped playing live concerts and started performing live concerts in my bedroom for a camera. It's still performing live, but you're through a camera lens instead. You can still say hi and thank you and see you next time. But the people watching are just through their own computer. Yeah, you get clicks instead of claps. Yeah, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thanks, man. You're pitiful lyrically lucky for history. You didn't write the art of rap. Their epic rap battles are produced out of this tiny studio in L.A. I get these headaches in the back of my neck. I'm like, why do I have these headaches and strains in the back of my neck? And then I look at the behind the scenes videos and it's me just like, and I was like, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. <laughs> you're making my ears bleed. You need a muscle. Why you pissed off all the time? Didn't your mom give you a cuddle? You're the type of guy Their first featured John Lennon versus Fox News anchor Bill O'Reilly. Every time I watch your show, all you do is scream at me. And your face the video had a budget of $50. I can see through all your tricks. I, I talked, you know, through the lens to the audience that was watching my videos on YouTube as a few thousand people and asked them for suggestions of, of who we should do. And they came back with uh, John Lennon versus Bill O'Reilly. Mm. And we both saw that and we're like, this is dead. This is funny. Stop your presses, Lennon. You call me Mr. Bill O'Reilly. When it comes to squash and libies, I come recommended highly. You're weak. Between you and me, there's no comparison. The John Lennon Bill O'Reilly video got about 150,000 views, which was enough to be like, this is great. We should do another one of these. So we read through the suggestions and we saw Darth Vader versus Adolf Hitler. And we both, again, knew we were like, oh, this is, that's funny. For some reason, Hitler was super popular. Huge on the, on the internet then. And then that one went really big. Back then, you could get on the front page of YouTube and it was like a big deal. It meant a million extra views. You could, it could change your whole life. Soon, their witty and inventive clashes would start drawing millions of viewers on release day. <laughs> Epic Rap Battles is now one of the most successful channels on YouTube. So what is the key to its success? I think that people like competition and they like getting behind a side, you know, so yeah. people like to root for their favorites. And then I think a, a big thing about it was at the end of the video, we ask who won and who's next and people want to participate. With amateur channels like these now making millions, YouTube is investing heavily by building its own studio in L.A and major channel creators get to use it for free. YouTube has become the new Hollywood for the average Joe. You look at the top 100 channels on YouTube, there's not a single consumer packaged good or apparel brand there. Hey guys, how's it going? So I'm super excited to make this video for you today. There's only a handful of media companies, but it's really individuals that have been incredibly successful on the platform. YouTube creators are a new kind of celebrity, forging one-on-one -on -one relationships with their fans through their computer screens. I think it's a feeling I will never get used to. Every single time I have a fan meetup, I feel extremely overwhelmed. It's like a very, you can't explain the feeling. The individuals that have become incredibly successful are those that have been able to cultivate an audience. A lot of what you can see, which is successful on YouTube, is about humanity anyway, it's about people and faces. It might be making you laugh, it might be emotionally charged, it might be very sad, it might be, it's probably human storytelling at its heart. But what if the biggest stars on YouTube aren't humans at all?
By the time you've finished watching this program, over 18,000 hours of video will have been uploaded onto YouTube. On Planet YouTube, you decide what you share, and the content you post in the virtual world can have an impact in the real world. Yes, we can! But did YouTube's founders have any idea their little startup would make such an impact? It certainly has surpassed any goals that we had set when we first started YouTube looking 10 years back. We never expected, I think, videos to reach the hundreds, thousands, millions, <laughs> billions of, of, of views. YouTube owes its success to its phenomenal viewing figures but how much does Steve himself know about what makes a clip go viral? Frequent videos that I would put up always featured my cat. And it's not that my cat videos were of any particular interest other than it being the first cat video on YouTube. But what Steve couldn't predict was that cats would become the viral superstars of the internet. What makes the internet go round? Cats. There are more than two million cat videos posted on YouTube. <laughs> With over 24 billion views, cats are one of YouTube's most popular genres. Cats are a little standoffish. They don't beg for your attention. They don't beg for anything. They could pretty much take you or leave you. And there's something about that in an era where everybody is clamoring for your attention and dying for you to look at them and approve of them that's actually very compelling. So who are some of YouTube's top feline stars? If you ever hear a snarky reference to YouTube as cats playing pianos, chances are this is the cause. Keyboard Cat's original video has been viewed over 40 million times. But one cat has gone a step further and turned viral fame into money. Grumpy Cat, real name Tartar Sauce, is now a bona fide celebrity worth millions. With her own YouTube channel, book deals, and merchandising. But why cats? My theory with cats is that people start to get this ability to make videos very easily. So they're sitting around and looking around their house, and that's the only thing that's interesting. Now why cats versus dogs? I don't know. Um, that's a debate for the ages. With even cat videos proving lucrative business, it's no wonder people are keen to unlock the secrets of the viral video. I think if you could put your finger on what viral videos have in common, then um, you'd make a fortune. It's like playing you a whole load of pop songs and saying, these have all been hits, what do they all have in common? It's, you know, you can sometimes find some commonalities between them, but it, it really is trying to nail jelly to the wall. Whatever the reason, some of YouTube's earliest stars have had their lives transformed. Now we have EP Bird Studios and we make viral videos for brands like Coke and Office Max and McDonald's. McDonald's. All kinds of things. It keeps going. The madness continues. So these nozzles hold the Mentos on top of the soda bottle. And inside of the They even have a viral manifesto. Mentos candies. There's certain characteristics that make a video go viral. Don't waste our time. Make sure you get down to business right away. Be unforgettable, do something we've never seen before. But really, ultimately, it's all about humanity. Recognize these guys? You should. Harry and Charlie's video has now been viewed. Uh, it's just less than a billion. Billion? Ooh. Which is um, about a sixth of the world's population. And what does Charlie credit for its success? I think it's so popular for the laugh. <laughs> if I see something funny and it makes me laugh, that's great. But if I share it with you and it also makes you laugh, together we have that shared experience. The viral video has become a social phenomenon, a contagion to which none of us has been immune. YouTube. I realized was the same feeling of self-discovery for kids that my dad had with vinyl and I had with mixtapes. 
It was this feeling of, oh, I saw it on YouTube. First, I have ownership in that. And with the power to rewrite the rules of pop culture. There were these gatekeeping industries, and they are no longer controlling what comes out of your computer screen. You get to decide. My biggest wish, maybe I can make another viral video within 50 years. <laughs>